Okay, we'll carry on with the morning. And our first talk is by Dr. Hamid, who uh, gave us a great talk yesterday of the journey of a red blood cell. Uh, and today he'll be talking about the disruptive innovation and the future of injury control. Dr. Hamid. Thanks, Dr. Perry. This is a picture of an ambulance at the Vancouver General Hospital. It's not a current picture, uh, but it's a reminder of how much things change over time. Uh, I work as a trauma surgeon and intensivist at, at VGH, uh, but I've also been blessed to work with a visionary group of software developers and business leaders in a company that I helped to found about two years ago that's dedicated to exploring the application of information technology and real-time data analytics to optimizing the function of trauma systems. I believe that we're all drawn to trauma surgery because, a deep, because of a deep fascination for the anatomy and physiology of trauma care and because of the great opportunity to restore form and function. And also because of a deep admiration for the resilience and determination of our patients. I also think that many of us are drawn to trauma care because we see it as a huge public health issue and one that we have an opportunity to help define and address. This presentation uh, is the story of trauma systems uh, development in North America and around the world and how mobile technology may be poised to transform these trauma systems. The story really starts in the 1960s, an era of steady urbanization and urban sprawl, industrialization, escal escalations in road traffic, apparent income inequality and civil unrest in many cities in North America and around the world. They, these cities were seeing unprecedented volumes of injury. An example was Baltimore, a city where burglary, assault, homicide rates were many times above the national average. Amazingly, in those days, no one in public health or healthcare viewed this advancing epidemic of injury as a major public health issue. But the publication of the National Academy of Sciences' Accidental Death and Disability, The Neglected Disease of Modern Society in 1966, marked a major turning point in our approach to injury control. Their statement that public ap apathy to the mounting toll from accidents must be transformed into an action program under strong leadership inspired a generation of surgeons to do just that, transform the way society confronts injury. In fact, according to Avery Nathans, surgeons returning home from conflicts in Korea and Vietnam with their organizational and technical skills honed in combat and the college advocating reform and improvements of standards at home gained a preeminent role in the care of injured patients. Perhaps no one gained as preeminent a role as R. Adams Cowley. He was a, a, a relentless innovator whose contributions led to the development of trauma's golden hour concept, dedicated shock and trauma units, dedicated trauma centers, military-style helicopter emergency medical services, and statewide emergency medical systems. Every one of these ideas spread across the world, disrupted the status quo, and transformed the way we approach trauma and, to some extent, other forms of illness. Cowley and others of his, in his generation developed the concept of systems of trauma care, an organized public health approach based on the constant collection and analysis of data that spans prevention, pre-hospital care, acute care, and rehabilitation. Recently, we looked after a bike shop owner who was shot at a Starbucks in downtown Vancouver. He lost pulses en route to the hospital, but through a series of miracles involving the police, EMS, the emergency department, the operating room, the ICU, and the trauma unit, he eventually survived and returned to work. His journey through the trauma system was actually decades in the making. And he actually re himself recognized that if any of the steps along the continuum of trauma care did not happen, 
he probably wouldn't have been there. In trauma, there's nothing more important than the system, and we know that the system's approach has worked. Since 1966, mortality from unintentional injury in the U.S. has fallen from 55 per 100,000 uh, in 1965 to 37.7 per 100,000 in 2004, as innovative injury prevention strategies have been broadly implemented and access to sophisticated trauma care within an hour of injury has been extended to 84.1% of all Americans. When the burden of injury is shared between acute hospitals and inclusive trauma systems, uh, we see even better survival. The most inclusive of trauma systems have shown that the odds ratio of mortality is 0.77 compared to exclusive systems. I have heard trauma surgeons say that the biggest advance in trauma care of the past four decades is the development of systems. And these systems are everywhere now. Uh, in Canada, 32 level one and level two centers provide care to 78% of Canadians within the golden hour. Trauma systems are built on a strong public health uh, foundation, including the collection of epidemiologic data, data analysis, and evidence-based policy development right across the continuum of care. It's a sensible approach, but after four decades of work on trauma systems, how far have we come? Or in other words, what has been the impact of four decades of implementation and evolution of data-driven trauma systems on one of the major public health challenges of our time? The fact is that despite all of these advances, trauma is still the world's number one cause of potential years of life lost. This means that every time someone sustains a major injury, which is about 200 times every minute, our healthcare system still has the opportunity to do something big, to restore human potential. People in low- and middle-income countries in particular sustain a disproportionate burden of injury. Of all deaths wor worldwide, 89% of trauma deaths occur in LMICs. Injuries account for 12% of deaths in low- and middle-income countries, only 6% in high-income countries. The problem of injury is especially bad in Africa, where injury is the second overall leading cause of disability and death. And even in the birthplace of trauma systems, the impact of poverty, education, race, or geography on injury risk remains breathtakingly high. Despite all the progress in trauma systems, all of the great information that you've even heard in this conference, um, Baltimore hit an all-time high in homicide with startlingly high vulnerability among African Americans. So how can we make the process better? As Dr. Ferrada mentioned yesterday, injury control is one of the biggest opportunities in global public health. Simply making the current known benefits of trauma systems more universal, we could save about two million lives around the world every year. That's just expanding what we already know about trauma systems. That would make a real impact on a huge global health, uh, on a huge global pandemic. The question is, how do we pursue this opportunity? How do we extend the reach and optimize the performance of trauma systems? I think the answer to this question lies in the data. Trauma registry data has sparked insights about injury and uh, injury risk and outcome for many decades. Over the years, our group has used injury data to map hotspots in our city and to identify vulnerability to injury. We have mapped our systems both provincially and nationally. And we've identified uh, vulnerable populations uh, in, in the hopes of uh, applying injury prevention strategies. <clears throat> but one of the most exciting opportunities um, in trying to understand the importance of data and the evolution of trauma systems came here. Chad mentioned about Andy Nickel and uh, the South African trauma system, and we've had the privilege of working with them over the past decade. Only a handful of systems, of trauma systems in low and middle income countries have access to injury data. Data access has become a rate limiting step in the evolution of a trauma system. However, early initiatives in this area have suggested that trauma registries may be feasible and could play an important role in the development of trauma systems on a global scale. The world is beginning to create trauma registries, as you see in this figure. <clears throat> in 2005, in parallel with the trauma systems work we were doing in Canada, we began a partnership with the trauma surgeons at the University of Cape Town to build a trauma registry for one of the country's busiest trauma centers that could serve as a foundation for a renewed public health approach to injury control. This is how their injury co uh, data collection looked uh, around uh, the early 2000s when uh, Chad and I first visited. 
The first step was cre to create a paper-based uh, admission note that could be used by physicians as part of the standard clinical documentation process, as well as by registry personnel to collect standard data points for performance improvement and injury prevention purposes. We were able to do things like map injury data for the very first time in Cape Town, to, to the astonishment of some of the clinicians working in the trauma center there, actually show them where injuries were coming from. But when the iPad minis came out, the game changed for us. We realized that we could have trauma phys physicians enter their clinical notes directly and uh, into iPads and instantaneously populate real-time electronic trauma registries with data from admission notes, operative notes, and discharge summaries. In preliminary tests at uh, busy, a busy trauma center in Cape Town, we found that data collection on our mobile devices was fast and complete and associated with a very high level of user satisfaction. This means that frontline trauma care providers would want to use uh, uh, this technology because of its ease and because it was fun to use and because it actually generated detailed and actionable data uh, that in, could improve the care of patients in real time. The cool thing is that data selected from standardized drop-down menus on an electronic platform can instantly populate a database. And although you can't see the fields of this database, you get the perception that the data comes back to the data set pretty clean and re almost ready to analyze in real time. So without even uh, uh, exerting any effort, we could generate uh, insights about the data that couldn't be before, such as when are patients coming in, uh, who, who, who is coming in, and where, where they're, what neighborhoods they're coming from, and how the system is working. Almost overnight on March 1st, 2014, um, we helped uh, Dr. Nickel and their uh, group in Cape Town go from um, a data austere environment to a very uh, data heavy environment. And they started to use the data as well. Richard Spence, one of the surgical residents uh, at the University of Cape Town, uh, dedicated his research here to looking at data that was being generated in real time by the system, and actually uh, developed ways to predict mortality uh, using the Kampala trauma score and the injury severity score. He also did a very fascinating study on the performance of uh, surgical registrars and individual surgical registrars' mortality rates and it was interesting that he found a difference uh, depending on who the chief resident was on the service and the outcome of the patients. But what's more interesting is he was able to stratify according to injury severity. So he was able to do quite sophisticated analyses based on a simple uh, data collection tool. So we think something amazing is about to happen in the world of injury surveillance. Accessible information technology tools and unprecedented computational power will change the way we see the structure, process, and outcomes of trauma systems around the world. What we found in Cape Town um, was that we could easily collect data wirelessly in real time and populate a ready-to-analyze electronic health registry. But we also worried, despite Richard Spence's work, that even in this data-rich environment, the power of the data to provide actionable insights to improve trauma care remained unharnessed. Collecting data is one thing, but bridging the gap to using it to change the world is quite another thing altogether. The question of how to get the most of real-time, high-definition and high-dimensional data is relevant to South African trauma systems and to global trauma systems, to all of us. We decided to create a North American version of this electronic health record, and we called it T6 for trauma care within the first six hours. And we went uh, to get investment to try to uh, uh, get uh, resources for software development. And the general idea is that if we could use mobile electronic devices to collect high definition data right at the point of care, um, we could actually generate a lot of uh, different types of insights uh, about the patients, uh, about critically injured patients. So here's how the system works now that we've uh, managed to try to harness the full potential of mobile devices. So in the trauma bay, uh, nurses and physicians would enter data on, uh, on iPads. The iPads would cross-populate, so physicians and nurses' data would uh, be uh, uh, able to be visualized by every member of the healthcare team. Uh, key data elements could also be sent to an overhead dashboard, so every trauma bay would be equipped with a real-time dashboard that's populating uh, information on the anatomy and the physiology of the injury. 
And then data could also be sent to a cloud where more sophisticated analyses could be done and could also populate hospitals' electronic health records. So we're moving now from just data collection to really starting to harness data in real time. And we think that there's several hierarchies of, of uh, uh, users that could benefit from this data, from patients to clinicians at the bedside, uh, to the way that services run, the way that hospitals manage their costs and budgets, researchers, and then public health workers. And when you start to get high resolution data, you can map it in different ways and create uh, visuals that might create insights that you might not have otherwise had. Uh, that, by the way, is uh, uh, actually uh, soccer fans in London. It has nothing to do with trauma, but it's a good visual of uh, the way that big data can be, uh, can be projected. In the big data era, as we start to see more and more of physiologic data streaming in real time, we have to deal with a high volume of data, a high velocity of data, a variety of data sources, and really to make sure that the data is truthful and, and of high quality. And this is, this is a challenge of big data, which we are currently in. But the, the truth is that we have an unprecedented ability to analyze data too. Modern computational power is very high, and uh, we can start to actually uh, manage big data sets and run them through very, uh, a spectrum of different types of analytic strategies almost in, in instantaneously. So a couple of examples of how data could be used, uh, real-time data, trauma data could be used at the bedside and beyond. Um, the uh, the uh, system rec can recognize uh, clinical patterns and can prompt uh, the use of checklists and clinical practice guidelines right at the bedside. We're working with a group, uh, at a, a step above this, we're working with a group in the San Francisco Bay Area to see how can uh, data right at the point of care be streamed into predictive analytics tools and even actually project uh, the, how patients are expected to do. Perhaps their need for interventions like massive transfusion or surgery or help to provide clinicians with insights about uh, what their disp for, uh, onward disposition should be. And we're, we're generating uh, quite uh, sophisticated and accurate predictions using real-time data. We're now moving trauma, I think, into the era of precision medicine, where we're actually responding to unique physiologic and anatomic indicators from each patient uh, to map an individual course for these patients. Precision medicine has traditionally been a term used in cancer, uh, in, in oncology, uh, but I think that uh, it has definite implications for trauma as well. Trauma services could benefit from real-time reports of their performance on key indicators like the American College of Surgeons uh, uh, Trauma Quality Improvement Program. Uh, teamwork might improve uh, through uh, better information sharing, uh, better handover and overhead dashboards that really uh, flatten the hierarchy of trauma resuscitation. And here's an example of uh, how data from a database can be visualized in real time. Uh, this is a graphic uh, that we're working on uh, right now, um, and this is a, a mock-up of how one might show a real-time uh, dynamic prediction of the need for a certain uh, clinical intervention, in this case uh, uh, using an impact score uh, to predict the probability of massive transfusion. These are actually the way that our displays uh, uh, will be looking uh, for the overhead dashboards in the trauma base. When you aggregate uh, uh, timelines or process maps for individual patients, into groups of patients, you might begin to see opportunities for improvements of your system. In integrating data can, uh, with uh, established programs like the Trauma Quality Improvement Program can bring more and more trauma centers into the realm of uh, uh, quality improvement. And finally, tracking costs. We can start to link our interventions with costs and really get, begin to understand uh, the true costs of healthcare. So, just to end with a note about disruptive technology, um, true, true disruptions in any, any industry, whether it's computing um, or, or the automotive industry or healthcare, uh, doesn't often come uh, from big companies or big institutions. It often comes from garages and from individual uh, practitioners who are on the front lines. And tr true disruption often makes things that used to be expensive cheaper and what used to be exclusive, more inclusive and more generalized. Um, this is a, an example of uh, uh, another industry that's being transformed by, a, by an upstart. 
And disruptive innovation, uh, to quote uh, Christensen from the Harvard Business School, is an innovation that makes things simpler and more affordable, and technology is used as a way of combining inputs, materials, components of information, labor, and energy into outputs of greater value. I think that uh, trauma systems have certainly come a long way uh, since the 1960s, uh, and certainly have made uh, all of healthcare better and all of society safer. And I think that um, with, uh, with your insights, now driven by very high definition and high resolution data, uh, these systems are poised to do, um, uh, this, uh, to disrupt the world of uh, healthcare once more, and hopefully to realize uh, some of the ideals that the initial founders of trauma systems um, initially proposed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Murad, for a really insightful uh, uh, talk. And uh, with questions, please. Yes. Yep. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Gracie Dinkins from Liberia and Redondo Beach. Um, I just wanted to know how uh, you guys have addressed the security challenges in generating all this data. How do you protect the data from hackers, from abuse? And secondly, the public's perception and use of this data. Uh, are you including customer-generated uh, evaluations of performance in trauma centers? Uh, many hospitals these days are now exposing their data to the public, and um, that's becoming very important in generating dollars uh, for, for hospitals. Yeah, thank you for those, uh, both of those excellent questions. Um, the first question about privacy and security is, has been really uh, at the forefront of our minds. Um, the pilot work that we've done in Cape Town um, was, uh, was done um, with, uh, right, right off the bat with uh, careful attention to security and to HIPAA compliance. Um, and that pilot now has about 20,000 patients in the database. But one issue that we run up against is where should that data live? Should that data live behind the firewalls of an individual hospital? Or could it be de-identified and combined with data from other, other centers? Because the idea is that the more data we have, as we cross over to like 10 million uh, patients or 20 million patients, I think we'll be able to start to generate more and more precise insights about trauma care. And that's an issue that we haven't addressed yet. Um, so just uh, simply, um, we, we are housing our data behind the firewalls of individual hospitals. Um, but in the event that hospitals allow us to pool it and combine it to try to analyze it, um, we've put it behind secure um, uh, cloud servers. And uh, we've tried to pay attention to um, exactly where the data uh, is housed. And it, there are, there, it is expensive to do this, but it's something that's a, a fundamental commitment. Um, in terms of uh, user satisfaction and uh, identifying the user experience with this data, um, that's a work in progress. Um, we have yet to implement at a major North American trauma center, and we hope to soon. Um, and what we're hoping to do is capture people's imagination with the data pr by providing them daily reports of their service performance, uh, monthly reports to trauma directors, uh, uh, time-driven activity-based costing for healthcare administrators, and even public health reports about which streets in their city have, have dangerous intersections and things like that. Um, and so we're really geared up towards uh, outputting this data to the uh, relevant stakeholders. I think the people at the, at the front lines in all of these areas are the ones who are gonna have the insights to sort of change their systems. And so we want them to get excited about the data and to actually use it. It's, it's an important challenge that you mentioned. Thank you. We have, uh, oh, Chris, uh, Chris Salvino. Uh, it's a, a fantastic talk, and we're actually facing registry challenges now in, a, in a Arizona. So I had a couple technical questions, if you don't mind, with T6. Is it going to eliminate, I'm assuming, the typical paper trifold? Because right now we are doing double entry on paper electronically. That's one question. Does it map to the existing uh, commercial EMRs that are out there now? Or are we still going to do double entry? And then on the monitor in the trauma room, which I thought was really brilliant, can you see other things on that monitor, such as lab test or order entry? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, those are all uh, really important questions. I appreciate the, those questions. Um, yeah, uh, so we, all we really care about is trauma, and we wanted to build the perfect platform to enter trauma data. 
We didn't want to replace conventional electronic health records. So what we did is we built T6 to integrate with existing EHRs. So really what, what T6 would be would be a front end to your standard EHR. It, you would collect data at the point of care, right by the patient's bedside, and then it would wirelessly go and populate your EHR, and that's, uh, the, that's the integration that we've, uh, that we've uh, done. We've, we've learned that every hospital has a unique um, uh, electronic ecosystem, so um, we, uh, we're, we're partnering with individual hospitals to, to, to try to customize how the data flows into their EHRs. Um, the, the, uh, the platform actually integrates data, it, it, it outputs data, but also intakes data. And my dream is that you won't have to constantly check the computer every two minutes for your base deficit to come back. It'll come straight into your system, it'll flow into the algorithm for shock, and it'll tell you that your patient's in shock without you having to, um, to waste your precious um, energy and time to do that. So it will, it will uh, integrate data from the EHR as well, and it will project that onto the overhead dashboard. Um, the dashboard is something that I'm very keen to see uh, how it influences the way our teams interact and the smoothness with which our resuscitations run. There's uh, one question uh, online, and it says, uh, an electronic trauma flow sheet that is functional and not time-consuming has remained elusive. Have you solved those problems? <laughs> um, we, uh, we, showed, uh, we showed our platform uh, to a group in New York City, and uh, we got that question, too, uh, that... They, the, somebody came to, to our presentation to say it's impossible to create uh, a flow, an electronic flow sheet that's better than a paper flow sheet. Um, he looked at, uh, at our platform and he said, I think you've done it. Um, the, re the, the secret was not to try to recreate the electronic, uh, sorry, not to try to recreate the look and architecture of a paper flow sheet, but to try to recreate the flow of trauma care. Uh, you know, how do we take handover from paramedics? How do we do a primary survey? Uh, how do we communicate in the trauma bay? So in, we just uh, threw out the paper sheets and tried to figure out what the process of care in the trauma bay was, put that into the user interface, and you can see it uh, out, out in the um, exhibit hall. Um, and then in, in reverse, populate the paper flow sheet for people that, who need this to see that paper flow sheet. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neil.